Hello everyone, this is Sarge from the Southern Appalachian Highlands Conservancy. This is our first virtual video in Adventures in Conservation, and we'll be exploring the mysterious world of lichens on one of our protected properties. I hope you all enjoy and learn something new. So, today on this hike we're going to be talking about something that is under our noses every time we step out into nature, yet no one really realizes exactly what they are. For this hike we're going to be talking about lichens. This one in particular is called Usnea. Uh, the genus is Usnea. So a lichen is a symbiotic organism of an algae and a fungi that are combined together. The fungi creates the structure of the lichen while the algae is what is the green portion of it that has the photosynthetic bodies. Um, they work together in order to form an organism that a lot, it basically allows the algae to live in a place that's not wet. You would usually find it in a pond. In this case, they can live in a very dry area without water for a long time. This lichen in particular is very, very good for tracking air quality. Wherever you see this, this lichen sucks up most pollutants in the air. If you see a lot of this lichen, most likely wherever you are, has very, very good air quality. So here's one here. We've got a really big bunch over here, down here. There's a few on that stick down there by that moss. And most likely throughout this entire hike, we'll see this everywhere. It's very, very common in the Appalachian region for just how wonderful air quality is, but you probably won't see it as much if you head down towards the Piedmont region, coastal region, or anywhere outside the mountains. It's generally it's, it's very sensitive. It's very sensitive. Another cool thing to talk about along this trail outside of lichens is actually a kind of fungi. Um, so this in particular, it's very, very common. You've probably seen it before, and it's, uh, it has like every color of the rainbow possible for this. It's called turkey tail. Um, so essentially, I mean, it looks exactly like a turkey's tail as if it was feathered out. Um, that's about as much as I know about, about this thing. Although it grows, it grows very commonly on dead logs. You most likely you'll find them either like this in like a whitish, palish color, or maybe purple, orange, and red. It's very, very pretty. Something you can point out to your friends when you're hiking along. <laughs> There's also a common misrepresentation between lichens and moss, and they do look pretty similar. I mean, looking at this patch right now, you'd probably think everything in this patch is a moss. In fact, if we get a little bit closer and examine this, this here, this little lighter green patch here, is a lichen. Now, I don't know the specific species myself. Uh, it's not quite powdery. Um, but um, between mosses and lichens, mosses are more leaf-like, and if, if you touch it, it's very, very soft to touch. It's, it's almost like a carpet when you touch it. Lichens are very hard. They don't have any kind of leaf structure at all. Um, sometimes um, there's some lichens that are very ribbon-like, but they're, they're nothing like leaves that stretch out. I kind of like these up here that look almost fern-like that are popping up from these mosses. Um, so that's, that's one main difference. And also, how we talked about earlier, is lichens are actually two organisms together, while mosses are only one. Um, and generally, mosses you only see near the forest floor and on the bottoms of trees. They can grow uh, up higher on trees, but generally you see them on the bottom of the soil. While lichens can grow on rocks, they can grow all over the tree, and they, they, I find them much more abundant once I start seeing them. Um, but, and then another misconception now, we're, we're talking about misconceptions, is that lichens do not kill 
their host. They're not parasitic to whatever they're sitting on. They're not, what they sit on is considered a substrate. It's not considered a, like, their host of any sorts. Um, they don't take energy from the tree or from the log. Um, unlike fungi that will, that will help decompose a log. So. It's really soft. Another thing about lichens is they have four different kinds of morphology types. Along this branch, we have three of the four. The fourth one, I'll try to find another spot where we can find the fourth one. Um, but we'll talk about the first common three first. Um, so particularly right here, this is probably a form of Flavoparmelia or the common green shield lichen. These can get really, really big, but they're rather slow growing. Um, this is a kind of folios. And what determines a folios lichen is the distinct upper and lower surface. So if we see on the top here, we have a green uh, surface on one side. That's, you know, that's where the algae is. It's photosynthesizing. But on the back side, it's black and doesn't necessarily have the algae on that side. That's the side that sticks to the substrate like that. Um, another thing about folios is that it's very ribbon-like. It, it, it uh, unfolds and has curves and curls in it. Um, the second kind is called uh, crustose. Um, just like the crust on your bread, it's stuck right to the substrate, and the only way that you can get crust, the crustose um, lichen off to test it or anything is to actually take the substrate with you. So to take the, in this case, the branch with you. So, um, let's see. Uh, so right here, down here, this little white portion here, it's, this is a crustose lichen. It is so taut to this substrate, I can't lift it up or anything. So there's literally only one layer or one surface to look at. There's one here, there's one particularly on the back hand side of this tree right here. You can see right there. Um, and there's a couple more up here. You can see the difference between the, the folios and the crustose right there. It's very, very stuck to the tree. Um, and lastly on this tree is the fruticos, and we'd already talked about this lichen before. This one right here, the usnea, the old man's beard. Um, what determines if it's a fruticose is it's very branch-like, kind of like like three-dimensional uh, like, like veins or antlers. Um, and these, they generally have a tube-like structure and they can be a little stretchy. Um, and they have a, a small, uh, particularly with usnea, a small little um, tube, white tube inside of it that keeps its structure. Um, so those are your fruticose. Um, the last one that we'll try to find, generally you find them on top of logs, sometimes embedded with moss, is called squamulus. And it's a mixture of the fruticos and the folios. So what it'll look like is the folios is the base of it attached to the substrate. And then there'll be like these little tiny cucumbers that shoot up from the, from the ribbon. Um, and that's what determines the squamulus. Another thing you'll see on lichens is how they reproduce. Um, it's a little bit far away for the camera. Um, but on top of this usnea, you can see these little cups that are forming on the tips. That is the, they're called fruiting bodies where new portions of the lichen they're forming and folding out of. You'll find them on crustose lichens, on folios, ruticose, spalmulos, all of them. Um, and they'll just look like, you, sometimes usually a different color, like either brown, black, or green spots that are protruding from the, uh, from the lichen itself. Don't build those, they're really bad for the environment. <laughs> the little rock towers. So, um, if you're pulling them up from the stream bed, those are its habitat for like mayflies, caddisflies, salamanders. When you remove the rocks, sometimes it can increase erosion in the area and water flow, and it can and also takes away many different stream uh, organisms.
home. This is that one tree we're looking at a lot. Um, I can provide some information about these kinds of lichens and why they're dark, although I don't know all of it. I really wish I had Amanda here because she's an absolute genius when it comes to lichens. Um, but there's tons of lichens on here. There's one here. There's a little guy right here. They're all different. This has like a bunch of little branches, but it is a folios type. Um, but these darker ones here, um, in fact, when I was here last time, it was wet and this was like really jelly-like. Now it's really crusty. Um, it's black because it's not, it doesn't have algae as its second organism with the fungi, but cyanobacteria. Totally forget what exactly that does. But when I get back into the car, I can look it up and then tell you more about it. Um, but on this one particularly that struck our awe when we were scouting this hike was the little orange fruiting bodies that I was talking about um, that indicate its reproduction right here. So, um, yeah. Wonderful lichen tree, super freaking tall. One of these trees has like a massive lichen on it that was bigger than my head, massive pancake, bigger than a dinner plate. It was uh, Amanda with me had, she thought it had to be at least 75 years old, if not older. Um, it was a massive shield lichen. Maybe I'll be able to find it, remember which tree it was, and I can show it to you all. lichen we'll talk about today um, has a historical reference also is called rock tripe and you've probably seen this before it can range all sorts of sizes um, there, most people think when it's dry and it hasn't rained that it's just leaves especially in the fall this stuff right here and particularly it, I mean it does it looks it looks exactly like crumbled leaves as if they were falling from a tree in the fall um, but so for one thing, these can actually turn green. They'll turn green and start photosynthesizing when it rains, and they'll actually get really rubbery. But the fun fact about rock tripe is it's actually edible. It's not very palatable. I won't pick it up and eat it right now. Um, but uh, the, the, the lichen itself, if you were to boil it like pasta multiple times over, it would get rid of most of its bitterness and you'd be able to eat it like pasta. And historically, George Washington uh, at Valley Forge, he used it to help feed his soldiers during their starvation. Um, and with that, as far as eating the rock tripe goes, um, do not take it from the rock itself. It, it, is, it is attached to the rock. Um, this is very important when it comes to sustainable harvesting. Only take from what has already fallen from the substrate. So I don't see any right here. And so particularly, I would not pick it up from this rock because it's still growing, it's still living, it's not dead. Definitely protect it and keep it safe. Don't rip it up from the rock. bridge here, if you look very closely, it's very hard to see, but you can see the squamulose lichens popping up, those little, those little branches, those fingers popping up. Um, those are most likely to eventually become British soldier lichens and they'll have little um, red dots on top of them. Wow, we made it. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> End of the trail. Hey everyone, thanks again for watching. I hope you all enjoyed our little adventure through the woods. We'll be having another virtual event exploring the stars and the night sky and teaching you all how to use your telescope or binoculars to make your first, or maybe not your first, 
uh, astronomical observation. Um, again, I hope you all enjoyed it and stay curious.